Good evening. Welcome to the Moffitt webinar on innovations in neuro-oncology. Before we get started with our webinar, uh, we need to share a few important messages. First of all, the content is not intended to be medical advice, and viewers should consult their physician should they have any questions. Viewers should not rely on information contained in this presentation or webinar for immediate or urgent medical needs. Additionally, if you think you may have a medical emergency, call your physician, go to the nearest emergency department or call 911 immediately. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking care because of information contained in this presentation and webinar. I'm Dr. Michael Vogelbaum, Chief of Neurosurgery and Program Leader of Neuro-Oncology at Moffitt Cancer Center, and it is my pleasure to host tonight's webinar, uh, which is going to focus on brain metastasis and leptomeningeal disease. When people think about brain tumors, uh, very often they think about the cancers that arise from the brain itself, something like a glioblastoma. But it turns out there's other cancers that can occur in the brain and that occur more frequently. For example, brain metastasis, that is cancer that spreads from other organs to the brain. And one of the most difficult uh, uh, consequences of brain metastasis, which is leptomeningeal disease. We have two experts tonight who are going to talk about the approaches that we're taking to improve treatment for patients with brain metastasis and leptomeningeal disease. First, however, I'd like to give a little bit of background about our program and, and our department, um, starting with our, our team members who are here to take care of patients uh, with brain metastasis and leptomeningeal disease. Starting with the medical team, uh, we have five, soon to be six, neuro-oncologists, both neurologists and medical oncologists who take care of patients uh, with brain metastases and leptomeningeal disease, along with a team of APPs, and we also have fellows and trainees who, who help with the care of our patients. We also have a neurosurgery team with five neurosurgeons uh, and five uh, APPs, as well as fellows and, and residents who help with the care of, of our patients. And then there's a broader team that includes specialized neuroradiologists, radiation oncologists, and a neuropathologist. So tonight we're gonna to talk about how this team comes together and, and provides innovative uh, care for patients with brain metastasis and leptomeningeal disease. Both of these can be very difficult to treat, but we're working on a number of ways to effectively, more effectively treat patients who have these conditions. We're gonna start with Dr. Yolanda Pina, who's an assistant professor uh, in our department and director of the leptomeningeal disease program. And she'll be followed by Dr. Peter Forsyth, who's professor and chair of neuro-oncology. We'll then hear a few words from Tyler Wilson, who is our major gifts director in the Moffitt Foundation, and there'll be time for questions and answers. Um, along the way, please feel free to uh, enter your questions uh, into the question box on the webinar screen. Uh, and that will give us an opportunity to try to answer your questions uh, later on in this program. So we'll go ahead and get started with Dr. Pina, who will talk about how uh, she is developing uh, our capabilities uh, for treating patients with leptomeningeal disease. Yoli? Thank you very much, Dr. Vogelbaum. It is a pleasure to be here with uh, both you and Dr. Forsyth, uh, leading experts in the field. Uh, one of my interests is in uh, leptomeningeal disease uh, that I will be talking about uh, briefly. Now, I'm going to ask everyone in the audience to close their, your eyes. Imagine jumping out of a skydiving plane and discovering your parachute doesn't work. What memories will flash before you? Now imagine the parachute opened. How differently would you act when you landed? Those persons who have been touched by this dreaded disease, leptomeningeal disease, perhaps know what this feels like. What can we do to open the parachute for most of these patients? And I'm gonna leave you with that. So what is leptomeningeal disease? It is basically um, when tumor cells go in the cerebrospinal fluid space that is a fluid that goes around the brain and the spinal cord. So as you can imagine, um, you know, when this happens, it can spread anywhere in the central nervous system. So this disease is very dreadful. The overall survival can be weeks, 
to a few months. Some patients unfortunately die in a matter of days and treatments are scarce. So we have known about leptomeningeal disease for more than 150 years. And we have known that it's very dreadful. First, he was uh, detected by a German pathologist, Dr. Ebert, in uh, 1869, um, after he recognized a woman who developed psychiatric issues. She was hospitalized. And uh, shortly after, she developed headaches and died in a matter of days. It was then coined by Seifert. Not until many, many decades later, in 1974, a couple of studies came out that first recognized it as a neurological complication of cancer. Now, um, the progress has been very slow. As you can see, not until 1990s, that clinical trials that were prospective, allowing patients with leptomeningeal disease to enroll were started. And not even yet, there is no effective treatment. Only in the past two years, a few, a couple studies uh, showed moderate improved survival with the use of immunotherapies. Uh, in total, there have only been a handful of studies in leptomeningeal disease compared to many other uh, diseases in, uh, in cancer. Now, how can we open the parachute for these patients? Recently, there have been advances in immunotherapy and targeted therapies that have improved survival in cancer patients, which is great. However, these patients have lived longer and um, with the improved overall survival, they, have, they can develop complications. And one of these complications is leptomeningeal disease. Um, we, however, have a great opportunity to try to develop novel uh, therapy, therapies and try to study um, this to try to help patients with leptomeningeal disease. Here on Moffitt, we are developing an infrastructure for leptomeningeal disease and brain metastasis. We're trying to develop a patient-centered multidisciplinary clinic and approach in which instead of having patients running around with multiple appointments, you know, in addition to all the problems that they have clinically, it's kind of like a centered approach where all the physicians meet and uh, sit down and discuss how to best approach uh, each patient. Not only that, in the clinical setting, but also we are trying to develop novel clinical trials to figure out which treatments be are best for these patients. Um, developing database, doing other things like improving guidelines. Uh, there are meetings that uh, periodically occur internationally and nationally at, um, to, to discuss and see how we can improve guidelines for these patients. Um, studying tissue interrogation, you know, it's, it's key. We don't know much about this disease. The data is limited. Um, we have recently discovered a few things, but again, the progress is very slow. So we need to do something about that. Um, but again, immunotherapy, advances in immunocellular therapies is kind of like key and vital. And it's one of the approaches and path that we're trying to take uh, to help these patients. Um, as Dr. Vogelbaum mentioned, you know, the goal um, is to establish a world-class interdisciplinary leptomeningeal disease and brain meds clinic to enable novel clinical research and establish new standards um, and, and, and better care for these patients. And this is just to highlight a few clinical trials that have been done. Um, just recently, Dr. Forsyth completed uh, uh, his RPI on uh, one of the trials uh, using immunotherapy with whole brain radiation therapy. And uh, it's in the pro process of uh, being published. So we're gonna publish it sometime, hopefully uh, this year. But uh, this study actually showed significant overall survival of 10.5 months, which overpassed that of historical controls, uh, other patients, um, typically with an average of three months. And um, there's another study that we recently opened using immunotherapy, but this is in brain metastasis, uh, unfortunately not uh, allowing patients with leptomeningeal disease. Um, and... There are other exciting things that we have been doing in the lab, uh, trying to use um, tumor infiltrating cells, which is a novel uh, immunocellular uh, treatment. And we're trying to 
use this approach to see if we can actually grow and expand these cells and see if they have anti-tumor activity to help and treat hopefully patients with leptomenial disease in the future. And with that, thank you uh, very much for allowing me to be here with Dr. Forsyth and uh, Dr. Vogelbaum and um, I will pass uh, to Dr. Forsyth. So thank you, Dr. Pena. Uh, for, for that uh, overview of the leptomeningeal uh, disease program. Uh, and um, as I mentioned earlier, there's going to be uh, plenty of opportunities to uh, ask uh, Dr. Pena questions about the program, and, and we'll also uh, have a discussion about some of the, some of the other uh, details related to the program. Um, we're going to continue on now uh, with uh, Dr. Forsyth, uh, and uh, he's going to talk about um, what, what's being developed in the, in the brain metastasis program. Uh, as I introduce Dr. Forsyth, I want to uh, bring you back to, to a commercial from, from many years ago. Some of you will remember something about the most interesting man in the world. Well, what you don't know is that Dr. Forsyth is the most interesting man in Tampa. Uh, and this is actually a billboard that was, uh, that was in South Tampa uh, for a while uh, earlier this year. Uh, so with that, I'll pass this to, to you, uh, Peter. Well, thank you, Dr. Vogelbaum, for that innovative introduction. Unfortunately, I'm not the most interesting person in Tampa. but So thank you, everybody, for uh, taking the time to uh, learn a little bit about, uh, I think, some of the cutting-edge research that we're doing, which is something that I want to talk about today uh, briefly. And I was going to talk about mostly kind of ideas and technology that's emerging that really gives us all hope and how we approach this uh, problem. So the, <clears throat> I was, went to a leadership course several years ago and the coach asked us all to close our eyes and imagine swinging a golf club and aiming to get a hole in one to put the uh, golf ball in the uh, cup with a single uh, stroke. And we're asked to keep our eyes closed while we visualize this. And there was about 30 people in the room. And at the end of that, he said, okay, you took your swing and you tried to get a hole in one. How many of you succeeded? And it was interesting because there were only about 10 people that put up their hands and said that they actually got a hole in one. And I think that's relevant because you know, we believe that we can and are making a difference in this disease, but if you don't have hope and believe you can get the hole in one, which in this case is to cure people with these tumors, then I think you're doomed from the beginning. Mike, are you controlling the slides? Can I do the next slide? So just a few, uh, Kind of facts and figures, which might be too many, but you know, we first of all have to believe that we're going to make a difference. As I mentioned, we most of the medical profession suffers from a incorrect belief that this is an uncommon or rare problem, but it isn't. So there's about a quarter of a million people per year that have brain metastasis or leptomeningeal disease. We're pretty lucky because we're one of the few programs in the country that specialize in this, and there's perhaps two or three or four in the country. So that's pretty uh, elite and special club to be in. It takes a lot of people to treat patients properly. And we try to uh, put together a team of medical oncology, neuro-oncology, neurosurgery, et cetera, to really do the best we can. It's extremely difficult for patients and families. Uh, and we really have to take a multidisciplinary approach and bring all these uh, services to bear. I'll give you some examples of what I call Moffitt magic. And that is, how, how do you get the lab to come into the clinic and make a difference? And how do you get the clinic into the lab to make discoveries or at least learn because you have to try? On the parking garage in Moffitt, it says to contribute to the prevention, treatment and cure of cancer. So we all spend a lot of time talking about treatment but we don't really spend enough time talking about prevention or, you know, or cure. So I think we really need to keep 
keep those things in, in mind. And then uh, many of you might not recognize who this is, but uh, President Kennedy, of course, we do, is famously said, we do these things because they're hard. And that's why it's a national comprehensive uh, cancer center because we do hard things and try to make a difference. What are you? Oh, down there. So this is an example Dr. Pena talked about uh, a certain immunocellular therapy, which is uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So in this case, we're working on something using a dendritic cell vaccine for both brain metastasis as well as um, leptomeningeal disease. And we do that because it's sort of cutting edge as well as that's a major strength that uh, Moffitt has working on cells that have been modified so they can uh, attack and kill tumor cells using the immune system. And this is really based on work with Brian Zernicki, who's the chair of breast oncology. And we're working together on this. And these are just examples of uh, mice that we can cure using vaccines that are raised against their breast cancer cells when they go to the brain. And most of the mice are cured, which is what the survival curve is meant to show. So this is the number of days, 91 days. It's a long time for a mouse. And most, but not all of the animals are cured. The vaccines raised against these um, portions of the molecules that allow breast cancer cells to signal and grow and divide. So in this case, this is like a HER2 molecule, this is a HER3, but the vaccines attack sort of the HER3 molecule as well as the HER2, which hopefully makes a difference. The really interesting thing is that if we treat mice with this vaccine, and then we try to reintroduce cells into their spinal fluid to give them leptomeningeal disease, the cells won't grow. So it's basically secondary prevention, which I think would be a really great model if we could spend more time working on how to prevent things in the first place, or at least to prevent them after people received aggressive treatment, then that would be a really good uh, thing. So this is a subject of a grant that we're working on in the meantime, we do have a clinical trial, uh, which is to do this, to test this in uh, patients where we deliver the vaccine intrathecally uh, once a week and see if patients can tolerate it and if their tumor goes away and if it's helpful, as well as what it does to the sort of environment of the brain. So again, who's helping me? Next slide. What is that? Plan? Is that you? No. So we are, we are doing the, these things now. This is an example of uh, an immunotherapy regime with uh, melanoma that goes to the brain. When I was a resident that was uh, God, almost three decades ago, having melanoma that went to the brain was a fatal disease. It was fatal within two or three months. And now with this um, trial that we... Uh, helped to lead and accrue a lot of patients on. We treated patients with melanoma brain meds and about half the patients benefited. So half is not a good number, but it's certainly a lot better than a quarter. And this is an example of uh, Larry, who's an ex uh, vice president of a Fortune 500 company. He had about 30 little tumors in his brain. One of them was kind of large, actually. He was treated with these. He did get a recognized complication of the treatment, which he worked through. And now his brain just has a little spot here that's a scar, but he's completely normal. He walks eight miles a day. And I think he feels like a million bucks. It's a theme that we'd want to reinforce that this clinical trial really saved his life. And now it's been about seven years since he was treated. So really for the first time, we can think that he and the other patients that have had long survivals are probably cured, which is a revolutionary uh, concept in tumors that go to the brain. So we're seeing we're seeing uh, treatments change and evolve. It's true with uh, lung cancers, with these other uh, cancers as well. And I probably don't have time to talk about this, but you know the airline industry is really good at understanding failure. If something goes wrong with the flight, then you want to know why a plane crashed, and there's a detailed uh, uh, investigation to figure it out. Well, people like Paula Rodriguez here 
really are working to understand this. So cells that are, it turns out that cells that are under stress, which he knows because he's profiled each of these individual cells in a tumor, if they undergo stress, one of the things they do when they're stressed and a little short of nutrients is they stop trying to evade things with their immune system. And it turns cell, it turns tumors which can be resistant to immunotherapies to tumors which are susceptible. And there's a specific inhibitor that blocks that pathway. So that's kind of pre uh, preclinical data that is another uh, project that we're working on. Can you do the next slide, please? Now, having half of patients, for example, with brain meds benefit is really good, but it's really not good enough because what about the other half? So there's a number of strategies that we're looking at now, which is combining some focused radiation in addition to these immunotherapies, as well as trying to understand uh, how it is that the treatments work or how it is that they don't work. So there's a... Um, let me just, this is the, so there's a new thing that's been around for maybe three or four or five years, and that's looking at single cell analysis. So we can actually take um, cells from a patient's spinal fluid, or we don't take them, or donate them, but we can take uh, cells from their spinal fluid or from the brain tumor itself and study each of these cells. So the, all these little pink dots are melanoma cells, and all those are a little bit different. But there's all these other immune cells like T cells, for example, or monocytes or microglia or whatever, natural killer cells. So these are cells that are really good at killing tumor cells. So how do we, how do we turn those cells on and help them focus on killing these melanoma cells that are over here? So we can do that by um, profiling these cells and trying to understand how we can uh, make them more effective. There's other cells here that fight that fight the immunotherapy, like there's macrophages in here that are really bad for immunotherapy and get in the way. So one of the interesting things about working with this, uh, these cells is if you have 30,000 cells or 100,000 cells, you also have to characterize the messages of which there's 30,000 or so. So it turns out that you can get like billions of data points, which is about half of the uh, fortune that Jeff Bezos has. In addition to it, it's about it's just a little less than the number of um, the number of combinations that were uh, coded in the uh, Enigma code that was used in the Second World War and broken by uh, Turing. So it's super complex, but we have the ability to determine this completely. Go to the next slide. So one more. So it. Maybe as a little vague, but this is our approach in general, and that is that we want to be like America. It's a lot of what we're doing now is looking at the world of brain tumors and leptomeningeal disease and recognizing that we don't understand the borders. It's like it's 1400 or 1200, where people didn't really understand where the continents were, or where the oceans were. So we're sailing. We're trying to figure out how to make things better by understanding where all these continents are. So we can collect fluid. And tumor cells, we can grow them in a dish, and then we can do high throughput drug screening with Derek Duckett and others, put them back in mice and see if these things work. Again, this is more single cell data, which is pretty complicated. And the other technology is doing proteomics. So the point of this somewhat complicated slide is only that these tools are available. They're pretty expensive and pretty time consuming, but we can determine uh, what's going on in exquisite detail and figure out how to target it. And I think at the end of the day, this is Sarah, who is kind enough to let her, us use her, like, her likeness, to, just to remember that, you know, cancer is very personal. And it's because of uh, Sarah and many patients who are on this call that we're trying so hard to make a difference. So I think having explained some of the some of our motivation and the way that we approach this, I'll, I'll probably stop and let Dr. Vogelbaum take over. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Forsyth. That was fantastic and, and inspirational. Um, before we go to the question and answer uh, part of the program, uh, we're going to hear a little bit from Tyler Wilson uh, from the Moffitt uh, Foundation. Tyler? Thanks, Dr. Vogelbaum. 
Um, and thank you to everyone for being on the uh, webinar this evening. Um, it, taking time out of your evening to hear from, from Dr. Forsyth and Dr. Pena, as well as Dr. Vogelbaum. Um, my role at the at the foundation, I'm the major gifts director, as Dr. Vogelbaum mentioned. Um, and I just wanted to share kind of the important role that philanthropy plays in every aspect of research that we have here at Moffitt. Um, from every new idea and every stage of research that we have, whether that's uh, Dr. Forsyth uh, pursuing the most promising idea that he can to developing a grant, to developing a clinical trial. Uh, philanthropy is really at the core of all those ideas uh, and allows uh, our fantastic researchers to pursue the opportunities that they see as most promising. And so we are really at this exciting time in cancer research and treatment uh, because of all of our th philanthropic partners. So um, if you have a question uh, about philanthropy or would like to learn more about the impact that your support can provide, uh, my contact information is, information is on the screen. I'd be more than happy to, to answer any questions. Um, and I really thank uh, everybody again for taking the time to be here this evening. So with that, uh, Dr. Volbaum, back to you. All right. Thank you, Tyler. That's fantastic. And it uh, looks like it is now time for question and answers. And I'd like to start by thanking our, our uh, uh, two speakers, uh, Dr. Forsyth, Dr. Pena, if you don't mind uh, uh, turning on your camera and microphones. Uh, that would be great. Okay, super. So we have um, we have a couple of questions already in the uh, Q&A uh, portion, and, and certainly we welcome some more. Uh, as as we're going along, but I'll I'll start with the uh, first one, um, which which actually starts out as as not really a brain metastasis or leptomeningeal uh, disease question, but 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 it's related. So we'll we'll talk about that first. It's um, uh, the the uh, the question is starts with a thank you for the opportunity tonight, and the question relates to glioblastoma, so the primary type of brain tumor, which which unfortunately uh, took this individual's uh, life in in 2021. Um, and he's read about multiple studies lately with promising new approaches to treat glioblastoma, uh, an example being Cleveland Clinic, my former home, uh, studies on uh, obstructing mitochondria, which allows uh, the disease to um, receive nutrition. Another one of a brain cancer gel applied directly to the primary tumor that was reported at Johns Hopkins. Northwestern implanting an ultrasound device to temporarily open the blood-brain barrier. And specifically, his question is, what is the level of sharing of these findings with other research institutes? So I think I think maybe we'll start with that, and then then maybe I'll, I'll make a quick comment about one of the other things. But but I think what you know some of what you saw in those figures that were shown by Dr. Forsyth and Dr. Pena were from publications. Uh, that's that's ultimately the way that we communicate in science is we. We submit our findings to journals. Uh, we present our findings at uh, uh, national conferences and international conferences. Um, and, um, and, and Peter, I'm gonna ask you to comment further, but first I wanna point out that one of the uh, key studies about melanoma uh, that was in one of his slides, that was the first study to show that you can use immunotherapy to treat brain metastasis, melanoma brain metastasis. It had never been shown before. And, um, uh, you know, Dr. Forsyth very humbly underlined his name there as being the second author. Uh, actually, he should have been the first author uh, because he put the most patients on that trial, which means that more patients at Moffitt received benefit from that very new therapy than any other place, including MD Anderson. So, so Peter, you want to comment further about how we share uh, our, our data and our ideas uh, widely within, within our field? I think the it's a good question. You know, the I think we share things through publications as well through as well as through meetings, and there's a lot of informal meetings. So we talk to people in uh, Sloan Kettering and MD Anderson Cancer Center. We're also working on these problems. We have some informal meetings where we share our ideas, um, and now there's there's actually a move afoot to share data even earlier than publications, which can take a year or two. So the NIH now, when you're funded, is requiring that as you perform the experiments, if it's a five-year grant, that these are uh, posted to a public, uh, web, well, it's not completely public, but a website to which, if you're a researcher, you can get access. So you can share the, um, you can share details about the chemicals, cell lines, and animal models that you're using. So there is sharing. We can do better. 
Now there's foundations, large foundations, for example, the Department of Defense, who is making grants, I think, which is aligned with your question, how can we get these people to work together more? So in our own in our own field, we hope that in August, which is a meeting that Dr. Pena is going to, that there's a, a, what a think tank, and from that think tank, there should be a grant written, which specifically pays uh, pays for the work that it requires to share. So the sharing of data is actually quite a bit of work, how you save it and how you post it and then how you access and share it. So it's it's a great idea. We're moving to be better at that. Uh, and there's no question that that has to happen. I could talk about this for a few more, just a couple more points. It's super important because in addition to sharing the information about the results, and I think in the kind of things you were alluding to in the focused ultrasound and other things, we should also be able to share information about how we collect specimens and you know, kind of how we prepare them and put them in test tubes and even how we label them and how we freeze them. Because if we all as a group do it the same way, we can all study it the same way. And then when we run our experiments on different platforms, we can compare them and make sure that they're of good quality and they're done in a way that we all understand. So actually that was a super great question. So, so we're hoping to do a better job, but it's super yeah. important. So Dr. Pena, can you can you talk about how you go to meetings now and start talking about you know the the uh, the studies you're doing, the results you have, the ideas you have, and how you share them uh, quite openly with with our colleagues around around you know the country and 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 also uh, around the world. Yeah, I mean, seconding uh, what uh, the first I said, um, you know, national international meetings are very important. Uh, that's, uh, you know, where a lot of physicians come from different countries, even, and we all meet and we have these like uh, extensive uh, lectures and discussions about the new findings uh, from different diseases, uh, different cancers. Um, and um, also informally meet with other providers, communicate, um, email um, regarding left disease and brain meds. There are like different groups that have developed um, and they have periodical meetings uh, once a month, once every two months to kind of like work on the guidelines. So the Volkabam is uh, uh, involved in uh, some of those, um, like uh, yeah, no ESMO, um, so there are many different ways of how we come together and try to share data and communicate and, and that's still in development It's kind of like a learning process. Um, so, so I want to, I want to, you know, <clears throat> add to that with a little bit of a comparison and contrast. Um, you know, we, we live in an academic medical, uh, community that is, uh, uh cancer centers like Moffitt Cancer Center university hospitals and, and 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 the like and and we in that in that world we we very much share we collaborate uh we work on these difficult problems together um the distinction is is um uh the industry as we say the companies um that ultimately are responsible have the have the funding to be able to actually develop the drugs and other therapeutics that we're going to use in our clinical trials they live in the corporate world, which is where, where secrecy is essential. Uh, they have to protect their intellectual property. And, and it's not really finger pointing here. It's just the reality of the world. And, and for them to raise the amount of money that they have to raise to invest in these new therapies, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars, they have to protect their assets. And we have to straddle that world. And it can be very uncomfortable sometimes. So, so each of us spends time working with these companies, trying to advise them, trying to encourage them to invest in this disease area. Um, but at the same time, we're also subject to confidentiality rules that they that they impose when we're when we're working with their drugs, their drugs that are not yet approved. Um, uh, so we have to straddle that world. But on the on the academic side, we, we are very much open to sharing, especially for the discovery part uh, of it. And that's why that's why there's the public funding for it from NIH. So when you think about your tax dollars going to the National Cancer Institute, going to the National Institutes of Health, that's that's what they're for. They're, they're to help to encourage us to be able to do the discovery level science 
start coming up with these new ideas for treating our patients, uh, and and do and we do that very very collaboratively. So so it's been a, a tremendous investment, and it's why the U.S. leads the world in new therapeutic development because of that culture. Uh, so that's very important to us as well. So thank you for that question. Um, I'm going to move to the next question here. And that is, would it be possible to take CSF and place it in a simulated Petri dish medium to test the immunotherapy treatment to target the tumor without too much apoptosis? So maybe, you, why don't you go first this time, uh, Dr. Pena, and, and talk about you know, uh, what's being done with, with all this CSF that we, we have been collecting on a routine basis, which I have to say is one of the biggest banks in the country. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm excited to say that, um... Uh, just a little bit of background uh, tells in short, which uh, which is tumor um, infiltrated lymphocytes are basically T cells, kind of like the policeman in your body that, that fight infections, viruses, bacteria, uh, but also tumor. So the idea behind this is to collect the T cells of the patient who are already programmed to identify the cancer cells and fight it. So we have been collecting cerebrospinal fluid from different patients um, who of course approve us to do so um, with leptomeningeal disease. And we have been bringing that tissue into the laboratory and we have been uh, trying to expand, those, identify, isolate those T cells, expand them because they need to be in the count of over a million cells to start mm -hmm. with, uh, to be able to develop uh, the treatment. And uh, we successfully actually were able to isolate for the first time in the world, nobody has ever done this. We're able to isolate and expand these T cells um, and do flow cytometry, which is a process in which we identify specific cells. And um, we are, uh, we have, we are in the still in the very early stages, but uh, successfully just recently yesterday I had uh, an expansion of the grant that we received for this. So we have another 12 months to be able to complete the study. Uh, like Dr. Forza, um, Bogovan, I'm sorry, was uh, saying there's a lot of politics behind all this. And sometimes this hinders the process, but uh, luckily, you know, we, you know, we're going to be able to continue working on this. Um, so answering the question, yes, we can somehow get the cells, not only trying to expand the T cells, but there's another process in which we can like whole culture T cells and the cancer cells and see the response. We can do that in a Petri dish. The next step will be to be able to do it in, a, in an animal model, like a mouse model. Uh, where that can serve as a model for brain metastasis and leptomeningeal disease and uh, study this before we can move forward and feel like it's safe and uh, effective uh, to be able to do this in, in, with patients. So, so Dr. Peter, you, you mentioned something about uh, funding because you mentioned a grant um, and you, you have a grant to work on this now, but what are the ways uh, to fund this kind of work? I mean, this is this is very very elemental discovery work, very high risk science. How does that get funded? Uh, it's very difficult. I mean, I was lucky to receive a small grant uh, from uh, intramural, you know, uh, at Moffitt uh, to do this, but it's very difficult to get uh, grants. There are many other grants out there uh, um, coming from the, you know, MRA and the NIH, and I'm looking into those because unfortunately too, doing this kind of studies is very, very expensive. Um, if we're talking about like trying to develop a clinical trial with patients, it will run around the $3 million. Right. And, you know, <laughs> so when you say, you know, you had some intramural or, or seed funding from Moffitt, Ultimately, that comes from the Moffitt Foundation. That's that's mm -hmm. where the dollars come from. And so it, it actually comes from people in the community who want to help support Moffitt, help to support this kind of cutting edge research. Um, that's something I've had the benefit of in my career, uh, where, where um, there were, were uh, philanthropic families who helped to help to support the work that that we were doing at my previous institution. Uh, 
you know, to, to uh, do discovery level research. Uh, ultimately, when you start talking about things like NIH grants, the amount of preliminary data you have to have just to be able to walk in the door and, and, and start applying for a grant um, is, is it's a tremendous amount. So seed level funding um, is, is actually critical. Uh, and so when you start talking about seed level funding, you know, those are grants on the order of twenty five to fifty thousand dollars. And it's amazing how much we can get done with grants like that that then can lead to those million dollar grants, those multi million dollar grants. And, and I think that's that's really um, a, a, uh, a you know um, something that that we're, we're trying to focus on is 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 helping to support researchers like Dr. Pena with those kinds of uh, seed seed level grants. Dr. Forsyth, the next question is going to go to you. Um, which is, is the dendritic cell vaccine in clinical trial or is it standard of care? Yeah, so the dendritic cell vaccine that we're doing is in a clinical trial. So the clinical trial opened a couple of weeks ago, so it's not the standard of care. So we're starting the uh, trial to figure out if this is uh, useful as we think it, hope it will be. It's also possible that it could be harmful in ways that we haven't thought about. Mice are uh, mice can tolerate a lot that people can't tolerate. Um, so there's a lot of very careful monitoring in a clinical trial like this to make sure things are acceptable. I'm certainly very optimistic. And I think a key thing about what we're doing is we're doing studies in parallel so we can understand why something works or why it might work or why it would work for one person but not another. Rick Pena and I were at a conference call with a couple of scientists today. We're trying to understand why some people benefit from one of the trials that we were running with uh, Dr. Pena previously, and why it looked like it worked for some people that didn't work for others. So it's not the standard of care. We have a long way to go to do that, but it's certainly very exciting. And it's just a wonderful idea if it works, you might be able to prevent it once you get the, once you get the uh, leptomeningeal disease. Can you get it treated and then it'll go away and not come back. A lot of us would put up with a lot if we knew that we could get it looked after and it wouldn't ever come back. So I think that's the dream, whether that's gonna work out or not, we don't know. So uh, I just wanna make a side comment here because I'm, I'm seeing some uh, comments um, from attendees coming through the chat and I don't have a way of responding uh, to them. So, so those of you who have sent uh, comments in through the chat, we hear them, we see them. Uh, and we'll be following up with you uh, uh, outside of this webinar because uh, we we don't have a way to do it here. We want also want to preserve uh, anonymity of our of our um, guests. Um, so uh, next question, all right, uh, and and really both of you, uh, this is this is for both of you because it applies both to brain metastasis and leptomeningeal disease. Is what are the difficulties that we face with immunotherapy delivery and the blood brain barrier? Uh, does immunotherapy have to get across the blood-brain barrier, or are, are there other mechanisms that may apply here? Do that, Dr. Pena. Me to do it. So, um, the studies, uh, like the very first one that Dr. Force had presented and Dr. Bogavan um, discussed as well, uh, that was the very first one that showed patients with melanoma brain metastasis responding to immunotherapy. This was actually, uh, the, the treatment was actually given systemically, meaning, you know, intravenously. Um, so it does, we know it does have an effect on the brain. Um, so I, in comparison to um, the standard or the old chemotherapies are like very large molecules. Uh, and have very poor penetrance into the cerebrospinal fluid or the central nervous system, immunotherapies do seem to have uh, penetrance, good penetrance to the brain. Uh, do you want to add more to that? That's more safe. Yeah, I was just going to say that that's really been a problem thinking about drugs getting into the brain or the spinal fluid. And Dr. Vogelbaum has done a lot of work on this for years. And has his own research program that he hasn't talked about where he's developing devices to overcome this problem. We know that with uh, T cells in the immune system, pretty much to be a successful organism, your, you know, your white blood cells have to gain access to everywhere in your body if you have a problem. 
So we know that they can really distribute throughout your body. So I think, although that's a great question for drugs, we hope and think that it's not going to be a problem for these immunotherapies. Mm -hmm. It's kind of it's kind of interesting. So immunotherapy is a very broad term, right? Um, there, yeah. are, there are you know antibodies that are immunotherapies. There right. are cellular therapies. There are uh, yeah. viruses we use that are oncolytic that hopefully stimulate an immune response. So it's 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 such su such a broad field that it it it's you know like you said like both of you said with with drugs it was much simpler either they would get in the brain or they don't get in the brain and most of them don't. And the immunotherapy is much more complicated. Sometimes it's stimulating a response in the body that's enough to get uh, into the brain. But are there is there a potential for side effects in the brain with immunotherapies? Is that is that a concern? It's always a possibility. I mean, the brain is such an eloquent organ that uh, it's certainly possible that things could go sideways and you could cause trouble. It's going to be a balance between inflammation and cell killing versus having too much inflammation or too much cell killing. So it has to be pretty specific and controlled. But I'm, I'm sure as we understand it, if something shows, um, if something looks like it's effective and there's some side effects, I think we can deal with those side effects. I think we can maybe develop tools so we can predict who's going to have a side effect. Like there's certain... Um, cellular signals you could pick up pretty easily in the uh, serum or the spinal fluid so that you could predict who might have a bad side effect like interferon gamma or something like that. Yeah, so so uh, it was also a, a chance to uh, talk a little bit about our onconeurology program. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, well, here we've been talking a lot about neuro-oncology, which is really about the treatment of brain cancer but we have also an onco-neurology program, and Dr. Pena uh, gets to do double duty as both a neuro-oncologist and an onco-neurologist, which is um, uh, taking care of the neurologic complications of cancer, and, and more importantly, recently, it's treatment, especially with immunotherapies. Do you want to talk about that some, uh, Dr. Pena? Yeah, I was actually going to bring that point Um we at Moffitt um, see these complications all the time, and we are on the high alert uh, with all the patients that are on, on immunotherapy. And there are specific guidelines and, um, that are constantly being evolving and developed uh, on how to target these patients so that we make sure they are safe with the treatment and what to do about it. Um, and again, it depends the type of immunotherapy. We have CAR T. CAR T cells, we have uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitors, we have the oncolytic viral uh, protein. So it depends. Um, they have kind of some deviation, but of course, neurotoxicities, which is what we call them, um, are, you know, uh, a potential risk uh, with this. And not just neurotoxicities, like um, kind of like a you know, autoimmune inflammation provoked by the, you know, immunotherapy anywhere in the body. Um, so. So, so exactly. I mean, it, you know, there, there, there actually are immunological diseases that occur in the brain. For example, multiple sclerosis. It's really where the immune system is inappropriately attacking the brain. Um, and so that's the other, that's, that's sort of the double-edged sword of these immunotherapies is, is they can be instrumental in helping us to fight cancer when it spreads in the body and in the brain. But at the, at the same time, uh, overactivating the immune system can lead to uh, some, some very bad side effects. And, and that's where we've, we've developed expertise in identifying and treating those patients. It's, it's really been an important part of treating all kinds of cancers, not just cancer that spreads to the brain. Um, we have a, an interesting question here, and, and, it, and it's, it's kind of reflects something I thought earlier in my career as well, which is what does it really mean to have a vaccine? You know, usually a vaccine is thought of as a preventative measure. How is it that you uh, can use a vaccine when someone has a cancer already? Um, Dr. Forsyth, you want to talk about that a bit? Well, I think in this, in this case, so there's primary prevention. So there's a vaccine which would prevent something from ever happening in the first place, say like a vaccine for polio or a vaccine for COVID or there's a new vaccine for RSV. So you'd want to um, protect, protect yourself from this uh, event ever happening. There's something called secondary prevention, which is what I was talking about. And that is that if you 
initially have a problem with this particular disease, that later you can be vaccinated so that it wouldn't reoccur. So it's a secondary prevention strategy. It's important in this context because the uh, dendritic cells both act to activate the killer cells to infect and kill the tumor cells that are floating around in the patient's spinal fluid, and then have a secondary effect where they act as a vaccine. So it goes, it goes through different pathways. So the treatment part is mostly kind of an innate immune response, which is something that's very early and very fast. And then the vaccine is vaccine effect is something that's later, which is an adaptive response where the body's kind of learned what surface proteins on the tumor cell it should attack and recognize right away so that they won't come back. So it's the mechanism of generating the immune response, not so much how it's used. Yeah, yeah I think you're so. saying the vaccine can apply in both both situations. And you know, one of the one of the interesting things um, uh, that that um, sometimes people um, are are not aware of uh, when when COVID became a public health emergency and a vaccine was developed, that was actually the fastest vaccine developed yeah. in 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 the history of vaccines. But the reason for that was that a lot of the basic work had been done with the same technology for using it as a cancer vaccine. So a lot of the basic uh, work to under characterizing the components of the vaccine and and you know all the materials being used and and the approach and the manufacturing all of that had been developed already. So now it was just a matter of of resetting the target, uh, and, and that's that's why that was able to um, uh, be developed so so quickly. Um, so so vaccines have have many different uses. It's really a, it's an interesting approach uh, to um, to uh, cancer. Dr. Pena. Uh, what do you think is the most promising area of research for leptomeningeal disease? If you were, if you, if you had a, a $50,000 C grant, where would you put that money tomorrow? <laughs> well, no question, sure. Immuno, immunocellular therapies. I mean, in, uh, for those in the audience in the past decade, it has been a revolutionary um, how immunocellular therapies have transformed the world and uh, improved survival in patients with cancer. There's no question about that. There has been no faster um, advance in the world of cancer than immunocellular therapies and targeted therapies. And uh, we have we have hope that you know, these somehow are gonna help our patients. There's limited data out there, but um, we know, uh, you know, that it can help by independently treating different patients, you know, but I, I mean, that of course, unfortunately doesn't count. We need to develop clinical trials that are perspective and include many patients uh, so that we can know for sure what works and how we can help these patients. So one of the advantages in the, in the um, leptomeningeal disease space uh, in CSF relates to a comment that Dr. Forsyth made earlier, and that is, you know, my passion has been about therapeutic delivery, um, getting things into the brain. It's very hard to get therapeutics into the brain, whether you give them orally or IV, or even directly deliver in the brain. However, delivering therapeutics into the CSF very straightforward. We do it routinely, actually. We, we place uh, a little uh, port under the scalp called an Amaya reservoir uh, that has a tube that goes into a, a, a place where the CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid is made. And then we can infuse a, a drug in there and it, and it gets everywhere in the spinal fluid. It doesn't get into the brain very well, but it gets into that spinal fluid very well. And leptomeningeal disease, as Dr. Pena said, is where the cancer cells are in that spinal fluid. So there are ways that we can do that. And so when you start thinking about immunotherapy and getting um, TIL therapy and, and immunocellular therapy to the target, that is the best case scenario. That's actually you know, a great area for, for trying to develop uh, immunocellular uh, therapies. Um, we have a, a question here, just a more of a technical question, which is uh, for folks who, who uh, unfortunately missed this webinar, is there a recording? And the answer is yes, there is a recording. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, the folks from the, the uh, foundation uh, will have it up on their website and, and have a, a link to it. Uh, I don't know when it will be up, but but um, it should be up soon. 
There, there's another question, Mike, that I don't know if you can see yes. it. Someone asking about the uh, how does the blood band barrier differ for? Uh, I was going to say I was going to save that to the end uh, because uh -huh. now that's getting into my space. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to sort of leave you guys, you know, to talk about everything with brain medicine left the main Jill disease. And I left it to the end because now we're talking about GBM. Okay. And the question is, how does a blood brain barrier differ for a GBM versus a brain metastasis? Um, and it's and it's act, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, the, there's a big difference in that um both brain metastasis and GBM involve a solid tumor that lights up with contrast on an MRI. In that part, you have a partially broken down blood brain barrier, which is why some therapeutics can get into that part. But that's where the, the, they become very different after that. Um, with a brain metastasis, it tends to grow, grow just as a ball without much in the way of cellular infiltration into the surrounding brain. Uh, and that's why we, we are generally very successful at removing these with surgery or treating them with very focused radiation. It's when there's really a lot of them, too many for us to do surgery and radio surgery, that the medical therapies come into play. And that's what Dr. Forsyth showed with immunotherapy. GBM, on the other hand, uh, when we remove the solid tumor, that's just really the tip of the iceberg, unfortunately, because there always are uh, tumor cells that are infiltrating into the brain for uh, inches away uh, from, from where that solid tumor was. Um, and all of those cells are behind a completely normal, intact blood-brain barrier, um, which makes it much harder to get therapeutics there. Uh, and that's why the, the focus for, uh, for, for um, GBM is how do we get treatments into the brain tissue where those cells are? And that's, that's what I've been focusing on, and, and perhaps we'll talk about that in another, another webinar. Um, but but the, the sort of the other mode of spread, again, for brain metastasis is leptomeningeal disease, which is what we were talking about earlier, where it spreads in the CSF. And there we have much better access. That's, that's much better. It's really coming up with the therapeutics that are going to work for those patients. Much easier delivery question. Um, and, it's, and, and so it really comes down to the therapeutics. And that's what Dr. Pena is working on is, is coming up with better therapeutics uh, that can help treat those. Any final comments? We have a few minutes left here. Any final comments, Dr. Forsyth and Dr. Pena? I don't think so. I mean, I think it's really important that we support Dr. Pena's research. I mean, a new young clinical trialist and a translational researcher. It's very difficult these days to kind of get your feet on the ground and get set up before you can go off and get grants. As Dr. Vogelbaum said, it's very difficult takes years and years and years. So that would be really useful to support your efforts, I think. So, so I'll, I'll add to that and, and say that, you know, for someone like Dr. Pena, who wants to be a, an, a world-class clinician and also be a world-class innovator, okay? Um, officially, her job is 50-50, but the reality is it's 70-70 and in terms of percent time. Um, she has to work. She has to work a lot, uh, a lot more than than you know someone who's just a, a pure clinician, and that's just the reality. But we sign up for it. She signed up for it. She's enthusiastic about uh, coming up with better ways to treat these patients, and and um, and and that's why we're supporting her, and we're we're hoping that that uh, you know we can get other people interested in supporting her as well. Thank you, and I want to add. Um to all the participants that are here. I'm sure some of them are patients, families. Some of them may have lost their loved ones. You know, my greatest thanks is to the patients and their caregivers. I mean, they go through so much um, that it's, you know, it's amazing um, and unbelievable. And they are very strong. And like Dr. Force, I said, hope is, is key in here. And we just have to keep pushing and fighting for it. Well, thank you both. And thank you to the foundation team for supporting this webinar. And thank you for everyone who attended. And, and uh, yes, this is, is uh, uh, recorded. And, and um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, we're happy to go on for another hour. But unfortunately, we have to, we have to end this webinar uh, now. Uh, but we're always available. Thank you. And have a nice day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Long.